Good afternoon and welcome. This webinar is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership, CFBMP, and the Veterans Health Administration, Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Education and Training Office. My name is True Lusta Pauling. I am the Senior Outreach Specialist in CFBMP. I will be your moderator this afternoon. Everyone's phone has been muted. If you have a question during the presentation today, please type it in the Q&A box on the right of your screen. I will read the questions at the end of the presentation and the presenter will provide a response. This presentation is not available after this webinar, but I hand out with resources will be made available. Ms. Mills would speak about this today. This is a live recording. I would like to thank Ms. Lily Mills for this collaboration. We are so grateful for your time today. But before we get started, I would like to introduce Mr. Conrad Washington, Director of the VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Mr. Washington is a retired combat Marine with 20 years of active duty service. Mr. Washington is a licensed minister actively serving in his faith. He received his Master's of Divinity in Pastoral Studies from Moody Theological Seminary. He has a Master's in Business Management and a Bachelor's of Science degree in Education. Additionally, he is a graduate of VA's Class of 2017 Virtual Expired Leaders Program. At this time, I give you Mr. Washington for opening remarks. Hey, thank you, True. I appreciate it. Good afternoon Good to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. As I always mentioned, I appreciate you taking time to stop by the VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. I know you have a lot of choices today with the number of webinars uh, that are going on, so we appreciate you. And as we approach December, actually we're in December right now, uh, this month is gonna bring many festivities, family and friends gatherings, along with religious celebrations. Please keep in your prayers and thoughts all the victims being held against their will, families and friends of those who are affected by hate crimes in Gaza and Israel and around the world. Uh, this hate is being exposed by extremist groups and individuals from online and in person. Let us learn how to respect diversity from all backgrounds, all faith, all ethnicities, in order to serve our veterans, their families, caregivers, and beneficiaries. So, with that being said, I want to take a moment and thank our presenter, Ms. Lily Mills. We appreciate you, Ms. Mills, for coming back and hanging out, hanging out with us again. You're on detail. We miss you. Uh, you're welcome to come back uh, as much as you, you can. I know you're very busy, uh, and so we do appreciate you taking time out of your schedule uh, to share uh, your subject matter expertise in this uh, pre presentation today, which is suicide prevention. So with all that being said, uh, the floor is uh, back to you, True Lester. Thank you, Mr. Washington. At this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Lily Mills, who will be providing today's presentation. Please read a summary of her bio on the screen, Ms. Mills is a licensed clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience. She has worked in various capacities to include child abuse, domestic violence, and substance abuse. Lily is an Air Force veteran and has served as Director of Psychological Health for Virginia Air National Guard. She has been with the Department of Veteran Affairs since 2013, working in suicide prevention. Currently, she is the Education and Training Program Coordinator at the VA Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention. At this time, I give you Ms. Lily Mills for today's presentation. Lily? Thank you, Ms. Pauling, for the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and bring forth this uh, valuable information. I am going to uh, turn off my video just because of the bandwidth problems we've had, and then I'll turn it back on at the end when we get to the Q&A section of the presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a, a safe briefing. And so I'd like to at least start by asking um, who we have on the line. And so I always do a roll call to see what uh, branches of service are represented. So do we have anybody from the Army? You can type in the Q&A box if you're Army. Anybody from the Marines? 
We have at least two Marines on the line. Okay. Anybody from the Navy? Anybody from the Coast Guard? What about my brothers and sisters in the blue? Anybody from Air Force? All right, I see it uh, aim high in there. All right. Anybody from the Guard and Reserve? Okay, great, great. Well, I normally like to ask who's on the line because when you serve in the military, it's uh, a different perspective you have. And when you serve with all the other armed forces, I deployed alongside each branch and you have a different respect for each branch and what they bring to the table. So I wanted to at least acknowledge everyone who have served and also those family members who have served alongside our members. And so suicide is an intense topic for many. And if you need to take a break or step out, please do so. We're not gonna go into any gory details, but sometimes the subject alone can bring up a lot of issues for people. If you need to, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 988, is also the Veterans Crisis Line. Same number, only difference is you press number one if it's connected to a veteran or service member. So I want you to at least have that available if you need to. Next, this is what we're gonna cover today. Uh, facts about veteran suicide, common myths and realities of suicide. And then we're gonna cover our VA SAFE, uh, which is our introductory suicide prevention training. And then at the end, I'll go over some resources and leave a few moments for some Q and A. So by participating in this training, you'll have a general understanding of the scope of suicide within veteran suicide within the US, how to identify someone who may be at risk for suicide and know what to do when you do identify that person. So now I wanna ask my second question to you all. What are your biggest questions around suicide and talking to someone in crisis? What are your biggest questions around suicide and talking to someone in crisis? So what I want you to do is hold on to that thought and hopefully by the time we get through this presentation, that question would have been answered. So let's go over some facts about veteran suicide. So as we know, suicide is the number one uh, public health problem that veterans are facing. The numbers are rising. The VA, as far as we're concerned, it is a national crisis. And so for every death by suicide, there's at least 135 individuals that are impacted. And so when you think about that individual, if they're employed, their coworkers, if you think about any other companies or interactions they have with people while they're employed, if you think about their neighbors, their families, their friends, local businesses that they frequent, any organizations that they are part of, you, you can come up with at least 135 individuals that are impacted. And there may be even more, just depending on how widely involved that individual is in their community and socially. So suicide is a complex issue with no single cause. If we knew the cause, we would be able to drill down those numbers. Often it's the result of a complex interaction of risks and protective factors at the individual, community, and societal level. Risk factors are those things that are associated with increased likelihood of suicide behavior. There are those, they are those things that overwhelm people, their challenges, their obstacles, okay? Protective factors can help offset the risk factors. Protective factors are skills, tools, things that people can use when they're facing challenging situations. So our goal is to maximize the protective factors and minimize the risk factors throughout communities nationwide. So let's go over some of the risk factors and protective factors. So let's start with the risk factors. So a prior suicide attempt it puts that individual at greater risk for suicide than someone who has not engaged in that behavior. It doesn't necessarily mean that that individual will go on and have another suicide attempt, but for the mere fact that they did attempt, it puts them at a higher risk than someone who has not. Okay? Next, mental health issues. 
And when we talk about mental health issues, we're talking about untreated mental health issues, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, all of these mental health issues that go untreated, it puts the individual at greater risk for suicide. Next, substance abuse. Anytime you engage in using mood altering substances, it puts you at a greater risk for suicide. When you're engaged in using mood altering substances, it alters your mood as well as your judgment. And so when people are under the influence, it alters their judgment and definitely puts them at a greater risk for suicide. Next, access to lethal means. And when we talk about lethal means, we're talking about weapons, we're talking about medications, anything that will be lethal to that individual. And that definitely puts you at a risk for suicide. One of the things that we've learned about veterans is that the number one lethal means of suicide is firearms. And so the VA has done a lot more in terms of education of firearms and firearm use and storage. Next, recent loss. Now this is a big category. It could be loss of limb, loss of uh, job, loss of a loved one. It could be many things, but when an individual experiences loss, it definitely puts them at greater risk for suicide. Next, legal or financial issues. So legal, especially when individuals are facing possible jail time, it definitely puts them at a greater risk for suicide. And then financial challenges. The thought of losing all your finances, all your savings, losing your home, your vehicle, it definitely puts that individual at greater risk. Next, relationship issues. Now, relationship issues is big on this list. Now, this is not a completely exhaustive list. This is only some of the ones that we have seen more frequently than others, but there's a lot more things that can fit on this list. But when we get to relationships, when we're talking about failed relationships, relationships that dissolve, marriages, you know, dating, those kinds of things. And when someone is experiencing that separation, that loss, it puts them at a greater risk. And many times individuals who are going through this breakup and this loss, it's almost as if they're going through the grief process. They experience some of the same emotions, denial, shame, guilt, anger, all of the same emotions that you would go through during the grieving process. Next, unemployment. So when someone is unemployed, it definitely puts them at risk when you're unable to have shelter for yourself, your family members, unable to have food, you know, the necessities, it definitely puts you at a greater risk. And then ultimately homelessness, okay? Now, when we move over to the other side, we're looking at protective factors. And remember what I said about protective factors. These are the tools, the skills, the things that you can use, the buffers when you're facing challenging situations. Access to mental health care. So someone who's receiving treatment for mental health care, it definitely puts them in a better position than someone who's not receiving care. So if you're suffering from depression, anxiety, and you're getting treatment for that, it's definitely going to be a positive protective factor. And there also are some mental health disorders that require regular follow-up and in many cases, medication. And so let's say, for example, if you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, you have to be managed in therapy as well as with medication. So when you're not doing those things, it definitely puts you at a risk of suicide. So when you are engaged in treatment and receiving the proper medication for schizophrenia, this is a positive protective factor. Next, sense of connectedness. Now, when we talk about connectedness, now I looked in the chat and I see all of these, you know, military folks, you know, hoorah, because it's a connectedness that you have when you're serving behind those gates. You're serving in a unit. You know what your mission is. There's a camaraderie that exists. And when you're behind those gates, it's a, it's a community within a community, okay? And it's definitely positive. Problem solving skills. Now I will tell you, this is big on the protective uh, factor list. You know, if we learn problem solving skills early in life, we would probably be 
able to deal with challenges much better. You know, as a kid, I grew up in uh, New York City and we didn't use problem solving skills. We just fought our way through everything. And I will tell you, that's not a good way to solve problems. But if we had learned problem solving skills and tools as children, we would be better off as adults when we face challenges and difficult situations. Next, sense of spirituality. Now this is very individualized. Some people will formally worship in the house of worship. Some people will meditate on the Bible. Some people read the Bible. It depends on what works for that individual. There's no one box that fits all when it comes to spirituality. It's very individualized. Next, your mission or purpose. So for many, when they leave the military, it's almost kind of gray and foggy in terms of what's my mission, what's my purpose. And so for a lot of folks, we continue that mission by staying connected with the military and taking on positions where we still want to help our fellow airmen, soldiers, and Marines that are serving. And so when you do that, it kind of connects you to a mission or purpose. Next, physical health. I say this very often, there's no reason to be walking around in physical pain every single day. We need to go in, get treated, get our annual checkups, get treated for all those ailments that you've ignored. And I will tell you, when I served in the Air Force, I never had any pain. I was good to go every single day until it was time to retire. About a week later, I had more pain than I ever knew because I ignored it. I just kept pushing through. And really, we don't need to keep doing that. So we need to take care of those physical ailments and injuries and, um, and just make sure that we're in good health. Next, employment. So employment is always a positive a protective factor. If you're able to sustain yourself and take care of your family and have a place to live, it's always positive in terms of a protective factor from suicide. Next, social and emotional well-being. This is positive when you're getting involved in things that have meaning, you're involved in your community, you're involved some way with the military, whether it's donating, you know, I donate clothing to the Purple Heart Foundation. I donate money to the Salvation Army. It just makes me feel good when I'm giving back to those that are still serving. So when you have something that is positive and you're involved in, it's definitely good for your social and emotional well-being. Now let's talk about some of the key findings of the 2022 National Veteran Suicide Prevention Annual Report. Now I will tell you the uh, 2023 report has just come out a few weeks ago. We have not been able to update the data yet. So I'm gonna go over some of the 2022 stats, but the uh, 2023 data will be coming out soon. So one of the things that we saw in the 2022 data is that from 2001 to 2020, that the number of suicides had a small dip. It went from 6,796 to 6,146. But I will tell you this, as someone working in this field, this is not a number that I can celebrate. 6,000 is still way too many deaths, way too many. So to only have a 400 or 500 you know, dip, that's not a whole lot. So this is not a, a slide that I like to celebrate at any time, but you know, it is the data. So I must show you that. Now, when we look at veteran suicide rate by age and sex, this has not really changed. The number one age and rate is 18 to 34. The next group is 35 to 54, and we see that at 31%, 55 to 74, 27%, 75 and older, 32%. But our number one group, 18 to 34, 46%, okay? That's the highest, and it's our younger veterans, okay? Now, when we talk about lethal means, so these are suicide deaths involved from 2020 all the way down to 20, 2001. And so when we talk about the lethal means, we have their firearms, poisoning, suffocation, and then other. Other could mean a variety of things, ramming a vehicle into a fixed object, jumping from a height, that sort of thing. But if we look at the firearms, 
Firearms is the number one lethal method that's being used among all groups. So we look at non-veteran U.S. adults, look at 2020. We have 50% are using firearms, okay? That's our non-veteran adults. Look at our veteran adults, which is the second column, over 71%, and that's an increase. So our veterans overwhelmingly are using firearms as the number one method. Our non-veteran men, 55% are using firearms. Look at our veteran men, 72%, and that was an increase. But look at our non-veteran women, 33%. And then the last comment column, look at our veteran women. 48% are using firearms, and that's an increase by 11%. Now, when we look at the other methods that are being used, none of them come even close to firearms. And this is why the VA had to foot stomp its education and resources on firearm, firearm safety, lethal means, lethal means safety. Okay? So what is lethal means safety? So in the context of suicide prevention, safe storage of lethal means is any action that builds in time and space between the suicidal impulse and the ability to harm oneself. So I'm gonna say that again. Any action that builds in time and space between the suicidal impulse and the ability to harm oneself. And so effective lethal means safety education and counseling is collaborative and veteran centered. One of the things that we learned at the VA is that not only do we need to educate the veteran, their family members, and the providers, because we have many providers out there who have never handled weapons. And so they had to be educated on firearms as well. And so most suicidal crises are brief. The time from decision to action is usually less than one hour. And so when less than five minutes, we see 24%. Less than 20 minutes, we see 48%. Within an hour, 71%. So our goal is to build in time and space between the thought and the action. And firearm injury, the fatality is almost 85 to 90%. All other methods combine less than 5%. So lethal mean safety does work. Reducing access to lethal suicide methods is one of the few population interventions that has shown to decrease suicide rates. And one of the things that the VA has done is we initially, uh, when someone was suicidal and they had a weapon, the initial thought was contact the local authorities, have them confiscate the weapon immediately, and that would never be returned to that individual. And what we found with that is that it didn't work. Many individuals were not forthcoming about owning weapons and having access to weapons because they knew it would be confiscated. So we had to change the thought. How can we meet them halfway? So one of the things that the VA has done is we say to the individual, okay, you're going through this crisis. You're having suicidal thoughts. How can we safely secure that weapon until you get through this crisis? Can we have that weapon secured with a family member, a trusted family member over the age of 18, or a neighbor, somewhere where we can safely store and secure this weapon. And that seemed to work better than just confiscating the weapon, end of story. And about 90% of people who survive a suicide attempt do not necessarily go on to die by suicide. And so what we have found is that if we can collaborate with the veteran, their family members and the providers ahead of time, we have helped them survive a suicide crisis, and we have likely prevented suicide for the rest of their lives. And so that's our goal. Now, suicide is preventable. And so now we're gonna get into just a couple of questions that I want you guys to uh, put in the chat box. So here we go. You're gonna write in either myth or reality. People who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. Is that a myth or is that reality? I want you to go ahead and type it in the chat box. People who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. Is that a myth or reality? Okay, I see some reality. I see myth. I see some reality. 
And the answer is, it's a myth. Because no matter how casually or jokingly said, suicide threats should never be ignored and may indicate serious suicidal feelings. So someone who talks about suicide provides others with an opportunity to intervene before that behavior occurs. And so when an individual has a suicidal thought, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a plan or intent to commit suicide. However, we should not ignore, you know, when they're having those thoughts because it may indicate serious feelings. And so that one is a myth. Next one, the only one who can really help someone who is in a suicidal or mental health crisis is a therapist or counselor. Someone who can, re only, who can really help someone in a suicidal crisis is a mental health counselor or therapist. Is that a myth or reality? The only one who can really help someone who is suicidal is a mental health counselor or therapist. Let's see what we have on that. Okay, I see quite a few myths. And you're correct, it's a myth. Special training is not required to safely raise the subject of suicide. So helping someone feel included and showing genuine heartfelt support can also make a big difference during a challenging time. You can help by being a good listener. You can help by validating that individual, listening to them, you have gone a long way. It can make a world of a difference. Now let's go over the steps of VA SAVE. And I said, as I said earlier, this is our introductory level suicide prevention training. It teaches communities how to uh, help individuals at risk of suicide. It's gonna help you act with care and compassion if you encounter someone in a suicidal crisis. And so S, signs of suicidal thinking should be recognized. A, ask the most important question of all. And I'm gonna pause here. I want you guys to put in the chat box, what's the most important question of all that you should be asking? Let me see you put it in the chat box. What's the most important question of all that you should be asking? Okay. And then I'm not gonna reveal the answer yet until we get to A, V, validate that person's experience, E, encourage treatment and expedite getting help. So S, signs of suicidal thinking. Learn to recognize these warning signs. Hopelessness. You're going to see a lot of that, especially when people are struggling financially and with mental health issues, untreated mental health issues, and feeling like there's no way out of their situation. Anxiety. That's that feeling of nervousness. Something's about to happen. Not sure who, not sure what, not sure when. Some people will have physical symptoms. Some people will get nauseated. Some people will have a churning sensation in their stomach. Some people will have a rapid heartbeat. Some people will have a full-blown panic attack. Okay. Agitation, sleeplessness, or mood swings. Feeling like there's no reason to live. Rage and anger. And one of the things we know about rage and anger is generally a mask for other symptoms, other issues. When we peel back the layers of rage and anger, we will probably find some anxiety, some depression, maybe even some PTSD. Engaging in risky activities without thinking. You may see someone riding on a motorcycle, no helmet, weaving in and out of traffic at high rates of speed. Increasing alcohol and drug use. Remember what I said earlier? You start using mood altering substances, it alters your judgment, okay? Withdrawing from family and friends. So those are some of the signs of suicidal thinking. Now the presence of any of the following these signs require immediate attention. So thinking about hurting or killing themselves, looking for ways to die. And believe me, there's a million and one things that you can do to the 10th power. Talking about death, dying or suicide self-destructive behavior, especially when it involves alcohol, drugs, and weapons. Now, asking the question. Know how to ask the most important question of all. So I'm gonna go back to the chat box. Someone said, um, uh, are you thinking of killing yourself? 
Okay, and do you want to kill yourself? And so I would say to those people who put that in the chat, you are right on. So this is the question that you want to ask. Are you thinking about killing yourself? This is the question that you want to ask and you want to ask it in this way. Because we don't want to make a mistake of the answer that we're going to get. So if you ask the question, um, are you thinking about harming yourself? Well, you know what? Harm can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. So we want to be very clear. So if I say, are you thinking about killing yourself? That's got to be either a yes or a no. Because harm, you know, I can harm myself by burning myself with a cigarette. But that doesn't necessarily mean killing, you know. So we want to be clear about the question that we're going to ask. And then there's some things you want to consider when you ask that question. So don't ask the question um, if you're looking for a no answer. If you're looking for a no answer, you would say, you aren't going to kill yourself, are you? Well, if you say you aren't going to kill yourself, you've already answered the question for the individual. Okay? So you want to ask the question where you leave it kind of open-ended. You do want to ask the question if you've identified those warning signs. Okay? You want to go ahead and ask that question. Don't wait to ask the question when someone is halfway out the door. If you are aware that some of these uh, warning signs exist, the person is making statements, you want to go ahead and ask that question as soon as possible so that you can assist with getting help. And do ask the question in a way that it flows naturally in the conversation. So you want to make sure that it flows with the conversation. I've noticed that you seem down. You've got all this stuff going on. You said you feel like you want to jump in front of the bus. This is leading into that question. Are you having thoughts of killing yourself? That's where that would come up. So you want to do it in a way that it flows with the conversation. V, validate that person's experience. I will tell you, if you validate someone, you have gone a long way. For most people, they have been dismissed. Their voice has not been heard. If you validate someone, you give them the opportunity to say what they feel. You give them an opportunity to state their opinion. You make them feel like their opinion matters. What they say matters. Think about this. We have been taught from so early on to be quiet that your voice doesn't matter. I mean, think about that to being a child when children should be seen and not heard. That's probably the first time you ever heard be quiet or shut up. And then as you get older, especially for our military folks, you join the military, those who enlisted go into boot camp, all day you're told to shut up and be quiet and color. And so there again, your voice is being stifled. You go into the workplace, you're not, and a leader, a supervisor, you're basically being told to be quiet. So for many people, they just want to be heard. They want to be heard. Validate them. Talk openly about suicide. Be willing to listen and allow that person to express their, him or her own feelings. Recognize that the situation is serious because it is. Don't pass judgment. One thing we know about human nature is that we can pick up very easily when people are judging us. And once that individual figures out that you're judging them, they will shut down. So we don't want to pass judgment. I can tell you, my career in the Air Force, people came to me with all kinds of situations. And because I was a mental health uh, professional, I could not judge people. They would never come back to the office if I judged them. And so sometimes you might hear things that are uncomfortable, things that you don't want to hear, but don't pass judgment. Reassure them that help is available because help is available. Encourage treatment and expedite getting help. So what should you do if you think someone is suicidal? Don't keep it a secret. Don't leave that individual alone. I don't care if there's nothing in the room. Don't be fooled. Believe me, people have found things in what we thought was an empty room. So don't leave that individual alone. Try to get that person to seek immediate help from his or her own doctor or the nearest emergency room. If they are willing to go to the emergency room, be a good friend and escort them. 
people tend not to change their minds when they're with someone. They go alone, they tend to change their minds. I don't want to go to the hospital. So if you can accompany them, you've gone a long way. Call 911. Reassure them that help is available. Call the Veterans Crisis Line. And remember what I said in the beginning. The Veterans Crisis Line is also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's the same number. The only difference is you press one for veterans. And now it's 988 versus the 10 digit number. So it's, we have made it easier for veterans, active duty service members who are in crisis. They don't have to dial that 10 digit number. They can just now dial 988 as if it was 911. And that happened uh, July of last year where we went to the 988. When talking with a, a veteran at risk for crisis, these are the things that you want to keep in mind. Remain calm. Listen more than you speak. Let that person vent. Many times people just need to get some things off their chest. Most people know that there's nothing singularly that you can do to change their situation. But if you're at least a good listener, validate what they're saying. Okay? Listen more than you speak. Maintain good eye contact. Act with confidence. Don't argue with that individual. So don't come up with, you know, these topics that are very controversial. And we know what they are. Politics, religion, all of these things. Stay away from those topics. Stay away. You know, um, it, it, it's just going to turn into a pissing contest and nobody's going to win because everybody has their heels dug in. Okay? Use open body language. Be warm and welcoming. Don't be like Macaulay Culkin on Home Alone with a shock face. Limit your questions. Let the individual do the talking. Use supportive and encouraging comments. Be honest and let that individual know that there's no quick solution, but help is available. So what do you do if uh, someone is on the phone and they express suicidal ideation? You want to keep that caller on the line. Don't hang up or transfer. I will tell you, I work in an office, and when I was in the office full time, I never really mastered how to transfer phone uh, phone calls on that phone. You know, I just didn't do it enough during the year to remember how to transfer calls. Leave that for our operators and our call center folks. You know, so just keep that individual on the line. Remain calm. Try to get as much identifying information on the caller that you can. Their name, their phone number, their current location, even if they go by a nickname. Just get as much information as you can. Conference call to the crisis line if you know how to do that. And when you conference call to the crisis line, how it works is that you call the line, the conference, uh, the, the veterans crisis line, the responder picks up, and then you can hear the two have an exchange, the individual and the responder. And you don't hang up the call until the responder has control of that call. You know, um, if you're not savvy at doing that, then I wouldn't do it. Um, enlist coworkers for assistance. You can use instant messaging and Teams. You can, uh, if you have a, a personal cell phone and a work cell phone, keep them both available. Um, if you're in an office, sometimes you may have to get up and knock on a wall so that someone can come and uh, provide assistance. If the caller uh, disconnects, you want to call them back immediately. If no answer, you want to go ahead and call 988 and um, press number one, uh, and you will get a BCL Veterans Crisis Line responder. And you can explain to them exactly what happened with your phone call. So when you call 911, you let them know that you were on the phone with an individual who was in a suicidal crisis. The phone call got disconnected. You need someone to go out and do a welfare check. And the emergency folks will take care of that. Then you go ahead and call 988. Let them know the same information. If it's a veteran or active duty service member, give them all that information. They're going to follow up as well. And if you're in an office, you can practice, you know, conferencing calls at your desk. And so that was uh, the SAFE training.
signs of suicidal thinking should be recognized. Ask the most important question of all, and that question is, are you thinking of killing yourself? Validate that person's experience because we all come from different walks of life and our experiences are different. And so when you validate people, you let them know that they matter and their opinion matters. And so you wanna validate. And then E, encourage treatment and expedite getting help. Now, um, I wanna go over some of our resources. So the Veterans Crisis Line, they are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Anyone can call the Crisis Line, that 988 number. If it's a veteran, you just press number one. Veterans can call, active duty service members can call, family members can call, friends can call, anybody can call if you have a concern about an individual. The crisis line was stood up back in 2007 and has been going strong ever since. Um, this data was for March, but we had over 6 million calls in uh, March of 2023 almost 300,000 chats, over 800,000, uh, 299,000 texts, and over 800,000 chats, and over 1.3 million referrals. And when I talk about referrals, referrals mean, uh, you know, an individual could call the crisis line and say, you know, they're having thoughts of suicide, but they have no plan, no intent, intent to harm themselves. They can actually, uh, develop a safety plan with the responder on the phone, and they would be willing to talk to the suicide prevention coordinator, that referral would go to the coordinator and they have 24 hours to respond to that individual. Now, if the person is saying, you know, that they're gonna do something, then we would have to dispatch emergency services immediately. And we've dispatched over 269,000 emergency services out to individuals. And we have local suicide prevention coordinators, we call them SPCs for short, and they're at every VA medical center. And we have over 400 of them. They do direct care, they monitor and oversight, they do outreach and education, and then they do report and tracking. We have our veteranscrisisline.net resource locator. So you can go on this website, put in your city and zip code, and you can find the nearest suicide prevention coordinator. You can also find the nearest VA medical facility, whether it's the actual hospital or a, a community-based outpatient clinic or a vet center. Making the connection. So this is videos, uh, vignettes of individuals who have suffered with mental health, and these are active duty members who have suffered with mental health, and they have, um, um, they're now veterans, and they have uh, gone into the VA to get mental health, and they're giving their story about how they got help. And these are real uh, veterans giving their testimony. Next, practice safe storage of firearms, medication, and other lethal means. Keep it secure.net. So we've been partnering with them on ways to keep uh, unloaded and locked up uh, weapons secure. Next, new lethal means safety resources. And remember earlier I said we had to educate not only the veteran, their family members, but also our providers. Now these are some mental health apps, mobile apps. Um, we recommend that you use these in conjunction with your therapist. So it's not meant to be, be mean that this is gonna be your only therapy, but you use it in conjunction with your therapist. And so there's some great apps and they're all free. You can just download. Next, we have a safety plan in our PTSD coach app. And a safety plan is a written list of um, coping strategies that someone can use when in a, in a crisis. And so there's six steps to the safety plan. Now we can put it on your phone. And anytime you're in a crisis, you can refer back to that plan right on your phone. And some of the things on there are like, uh, where are some safe places I can go? Who are people that I can call when I'm in a crisis? Um, if I have any weapons, are they secured and locked up? Who can I hand them over to? Where's the nearest hospital? Those are the kinds of things that would be included in a safety plan. Coaching in the care. So this is a program where family members who have concerns regarding a veteran 
um, they can call coaching in the care. If this individual is unwilling to seek care, they can call coaching in the care and get some tips on how to um, encourage that person to get treatment. And they can also speak to the individual as well. We have um, LGBTQ resources. Um, this is something that has come out more recently. And so we just wanna make sure that we're providing resources to all our veteran communities. So um, we have new resources out for LGBTQ. Postvention resources, we don't talk about postvention a lot, but we do have tragedies in our community. And so our community, our providers and our workplace, we all have to be ready and um, be able to provide services. So we have our MIREC, um, which is our medical research um, center, and they have provide uh, free postvention trainings and um, resources. And so it's a good resource to have. Next, our VA safe training. Um, we partner with Psych Armor Institute and they have our VA safe training online where you can take for free. All you have to do is register on their website and um, you can take the training. It's about 25 minutes. We encourage communities to take it. Anybody who's serving veterans, we ask them to take that training and it's all for free. And so now I'm going to, um, I'm at the very end. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Ms. True and we will go ahead and do some Q and A. Thank you so much, uh, Lily, for that excellent presentation as always. Um, there were a lot of comments in the Q&A boxes. Um, there was one question that I recognized uh, from Mr. Larry Pratt. Um, he wants to know how he can reach out uh, to be trained as a suicide uh, crisis responder. He worked uh, when he was in the prison as a suicide observation aide and he wants to get more information or advice on um, how to how to go about becoming a suicide crisis responder. And we have his email address so we can provide that to you if you care to reach out to him. Okay, yeah, we can take that one offline. Okay, okay. Uh, the rest of the uh, uh, Q&A box, there, uh, there are comments. Uh, there are no other questions at this time. Uh, if we do, or if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to Ms. Lily Mills. Her point of contact information is on the screen right now. This is her email address. You can reach out to her directly and she'll be glad to respond back to you. At this time, I'm gonna turn the mic back over. Thank you so much, Ms. Mills, for another excellent presentation. We are so grateful for your time today. I'm going to turn the mic back over to Mr. Washington for closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, True. I want to echo your comments as well. Lily, thank you. Appreciate you coming back to join us again and uh, providing great information to the audience as usual. Uh, very, very good information. And I really hope that uh, I believe that everyone will benefit from uh, the information. So we want to uh, have you back when you have an opportunity. We wish you well, you and your family. Happy holidays. And to all of you joining us, uh, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to all of you. Uh, take care and be blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mills. Again, our team point of contact information is on the screen here as well. If you have questions for us, please see our email. We also have our website, email address, and Facebook page address on this point of contact page as well. If you registered for this event, we will provide you with today's resources. A recording of this webinar will be provided on our website at a later date. Please subscribe to our website and Facebook page for future webinars and sharing of information. This adjourns today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope everyone have a safe and wonderful holiday. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.